Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you all so much for being here today in the auditorium and online. I'm sorry about what has been falling from the sky so far today. I looked out the window and I saw, I was like, oh no, it begins. <laughs> but that's all right. We know that God is in all control. We're thankful for it. Um, I do have an announcement to take care of this morning. I actually have a couple of them, but I only have one that I'm going to take care of. And Brother Mark's got an exciting announcement that he's going to be taking care of also. But the announcement that I wanted to mention this morning is about the DeRikers baby shower. So we're going to be having a baby shower coming up on December 4th. It isn't in your bulletin, so hopefully you have one of those and you can remember this. But December 4th, from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock. And we're asking if you would come and just bring diapers and wipes. That's it. The Rikers have said that they have everything all taken care of, but they would really appreciate some diapers and wipes. And so we're going to bless them with this gift. But it is just a drop-in baby shower. So you don't have to come and hang out and spend a whole bunch of time. Just come on in, say hi, be a blessing to the Rikers, and show your love for them. But the date for that is December 4th from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock. So make sure you mark that on your calendars and that you're able to be a blessing to the Rikers that way. So that does it for my announcement. Brother Mark does have an announcement to take care of, and he's going to open us with a word of prayer. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Isn't it wonderful to be in God's house this morning? So I do have a very exciting announcement, one that I am just bubbling over with. Um, we have missed greatly being able to get together with our kids over the last uh, year and a half or so. And normally this time of year, we would be well into our practice for our Christmas program. But uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do that this year. However, Saturday, December the 11th, we are going to have a Christmas party for our kids. So parents, you should have received an email last night with the details. It's going to be from 11.30 a.m. till 1.30 p.m. Here at the building, we're going to play some games, we're going to do some crafts, we're going to eat some pizza. Of course, Miss Cindy's involved, so you know pizza is involved. <laughs> so um, we will uh, look forward to seeing the kids there. Um, unfortunately, uh, our building is not to the point to where we can... Uh, start doing the full outreach like we love to do with our Easter program and VBS. So this is going to be for the children of our church family. Uh, ages four up through the sixth grade. We will um, look forward to hearing back from the parents. Uh, I've uh, asked that uh, parents register for the activity uh, at the, on the church website. Uh, please do that as soon as you know whether the kids will be able to attend. That will help us uh, to plan accordingly. Also gives us the latest contact information and health information as far as allergies and things like that that we need to be aware of. Um, I'm excited. I can't tell you how much. Uh, but if any of you adults would like to help with the activity, feel free to get in touch with me. Uh, shoot me a text, give me a call, stop me after the service, and uh, we'll get you on board helping out. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and get the service underway. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for who you are. And because of your love, because of your grace and your mercy, we have had the privilege to call you Father. And as we gather here today, we ask that you would help us to set aside the cares of our everyday lives, the things that weigh heavy on our hearts and so focus solely on you because you are worthy of everything we have to give. We ask that you would be honored and you would be pleased by the singing and by the preaching of the word and that our hearts would be open that we would be willing to hear, and not only to hear, but to act and to change so that we can be more like the lovely Lord Jesus, for it's in his precious, wonderful name that we pray. Amen. 
Let us take our hymn books and turn to 175, Standing on the Promises. Of course, we can't sing this sentence down, but let's stand as we sing. Number 175. seated. As you grab a seat, would you please grab your Bibles for scripture reading this morning. Turn to John chapter 15. It's good. I heard an oh boy. Don't burn them all up before the sermon or you won't be excited for that. <laughs> oh man, good to see so many of you here. What a great day. I thought with the snow, you all saw the message that I sent. I thought, oh dear, you know, I had, uh, I had checked before leaving and uh, saw nothing about all this snow. And I thought, oh man, so when we got here, I was glad the roads were just wet the whole time, but I thought, oh, it's the first time. There may be people that don't come. I was wrong. You all are here in force, and I love it. So glad that you're here good day to be reminded that God is in control of the seasons. I don't know, maybe, maybe there's some adults here that are happy about the snow, but if you have a bad attitude toward the snow, just ask the kids what they think. I stopped in the nursery before coming up and I said, what do you guys think of the snow? And right away all the kids were like, yeah, you know, so it's pretty cute. I do have a couple announcements to take care of before we get into our scripture reading, a couple things that I just wanted to talk about. Uh, deacon nominations are due today. If you weren't here in the building last week or you didn't catch the service, this will come as a surprise to you. But last week we opened up the nomination process. That's fine if you didn't know about it. And today's the day that you do because this is the deadline day. So if you have one of those forms, hand it to me personally. Uh, if you can only find a deacon, go ahead. I know sometimes it's hard to catch me. 
So if there's only a deacon available, that's fine. You can hand it to them as well if you know who they are. Otherwise, just come and find me. And if all you got to do is stick your arm out to hand it to me, you say, who can do a deacon nomination? Anyone that is a voting member of the church. So you have to be a member of the church in 18 years or older. If all of a sudden you're panicked because, oh no, I grabbed that form, I even filled it out, but I left it at home. I don't know what I was thinking. Printed off another fresh stack of them for you there. You can grab one and fill it out. If there's someone that you think would be a good fit for the office of deacon, maybe you're feeling a little insecure, not knowing for sure if they qualify, nominate them. That's what the process is all about. And we can find out if they're qualified or not in a private conversation, but you go ahead and nominate them. I know that guys will be encouraged that, that, uh, that you see them as being servants that way. So nomination forms are due today. And then also, uh, Brother Bob had brought a couple petitions last week. If you're interested in signing it, we're not pressuring you, but offering it. If you're concerned about voter security in our state, there's a petition going around to try and clarify, you know, who can vote and making sure that that's done without any fraud. And so he's got a petition for that. And these are sponsored, by the way, by, by our own state lawmakers. Uh, so you're giving them quite a bit of authority to go to some of these committees and start a bill is the whole idea. This is what the people are saying and get a bill on the books. So you're a part of that first step process. So he's got two. Number one is the, um, the security of our votes in the state of Michigan. And then the second one is um, re reopening the state according to our state constitution. Um, and he had to bring them back because all of them were full last week. I didn't, he, he, he said, there isn't even room for you to sign, Pastor. So I haven't even seen them yet, but he brought them back. He's got some fresh copies. So if those are issues that you're concerned about, he's trying to facilitate that for you today, all right? So a huge thank you to Brother Bob. Um, those were the two things that I wanted to take care of. And just wanted to briefly mention, if you received the email for registering for the Christmas uh, celebration for the kids, kind of warming up junior church, getting it started, and then launching it uh, in probably in January, getting junior church fully running um, every single Sunday. So we're kind of ramping it up a little bit and just getting the kids used to things and used to each other. And so I did the registration last night laying in bed, and it took me about three minutes. It's just one of those things you see in your email, and you're like, oh, I'll have to do that. It's super simple. Grab your phone, do it while you're laying on your back in bed before you go to sleep. It takes three minutes to register your kids, and then you're glad that you did it. And more importantly, Brother Mark and, and uh, Sister Cindy Samples are encouraged because it, it lets them know people care. When he has to call and say, you know, are you not bringing your kids? Oh, no, I was going to. I just completely forgot because I didn't care about it, right? That's not the truth. You just get busy and forget. So encourage you. I did it. It's super simple. Usually Cherry does those things, but I thought... I just want to do it to see what it's like. So super simple, very good. If you got that email, make sure you take care of it. John chapter 15 for our scripture reading this morning. A passage that um, is going to need a fair bit of digging, but there are some blessings that we can see that are going to direct our worship today. How good is Jesus? John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, Jesus says. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Pause for just a second and point out there's basically two options and that's it. You're either a part of the kingdom of God through Jesus, which is cast away, fuel for a furnace, or you are a part of Christ, and God will trim you, <laughs> right? It's like, oh man, those are the options. Is there another one where life is just easy, and I'm a part of the kingdom? He transitions in verse 3 and says, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same, the same bringeth forth much fruit. I love this, for without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, 
He is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. How is your relationship with Jesus today? What would you like it to be? Let's make sure that we understand that worship isn't a thing that we do for a thing but it's something you do as an individual for a God who loves you. And so abide in him. The best thing you could be today is desperate. And the worst thing you could be today is proud. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Very simple today. Let's unite our hearts around this one concept. We need Jesus. And we're gonna explore what that actually means and what happens when we do. But would you please give that kind of affection to Jesus today if you're here in the building. Maybe you came in and you weren't in that place. Life has been chaotic. Your week has been horrible. And you have admittedly not spent any time thinking about God. Well, that's what worship is about, bringing you to that place. And of course, if you've been excited about this all week long, well, then let's do it together. Abide in me. Would you please spend just a little bit of time in prayer and ask that God would prepare your heart to abide in Christ, that you would learn what that means today. Tell the Lord Jesus that you need him. So if I could just have a little bit of music from the piano, just something real short, and we'll give you all a chance to pray right now, okay? take our hymn books and turn to number 389. For 389, I am resolved. We'll sing the first, second, and last verse, please. and turn to 125. 125, Jesus paid it all. <clears throat> the 
first, we'll sing the first, second, and last. I hear the Savior say, my strength and need is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson. shepherd of my soul keep me close I love you so lead me where the waters flow in your rich green pastures be me a guide I'm in your care keep my feet from every snare I will follow anywhere you call me to go I'll not wish for more. I will seek your kingdom first. I will trust all that you do. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I rejoice in Shepherd of eternity, all my future you can see. Show me what is best for me. I trust in your goodness. In the valley I'll not fear. Through the storm your voice I hear. Your strong arm is always near. I rest in your love. will I'm content I'll not wish for more I will seek your kingdom first I will trust all that you do thank you Lord thank you Lord I rejoice in you thank you Lord thank you Lord I That was just absolutely the right song. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Get that thing put back where it belongs. 
All right, I want to take you to a passage different than where we started in our scripture reading, but eventually we're going to weave around and come back to John chapter 15. And so for the time being, take your Bibles to Acts chapter 16 for just a moment. As you're turning to Acts chapter 16, I kind of slipped it in there. Some of you feel cheated. Should we do that again? I'm ready to get to work. If you would please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. You know, it's funny. It's really hard to catch that. Some of you just never miss it. But when we have a guest preacher and I'll sit down, I miss it every time. Just every single time I never say, oh boy, because you've got to be ready for it. Acts chapter 16. Um, I found such a good quote from the world's perspective on happiness. It's written by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne lived right up until the Civil War and was there at the beginning of the Civil War, met Abraham Lincoln, uh, just a, uh, made a huge impression on a lot of people at a critical time in our country's formation. I, I couldn't say he was a godly man, but he was a thinker for sure. And Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote this, happiness in this world, when it comes, comes incidentally. Make it the object of pursuit and it leads us a wild goose chase and is never attained. Follow some other object, and very possibly we may find that we have caught happiness without dreaming of it. That is to say, in the world, when you try to create happiness for yourself, you almost never do. What are some ways that the world tries to create happiness for themselves? Yeah, for sure. Money. If only I had enough money, all my problems would go away. Anybody else? Prestige, yeah, notoriety. And now it's followers on social media, I suppose. That's the measure of somebody. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, looking for a next person in their life. Good, mama. Family, Family? yeah. Oh, famous people, yes, absolutely. Being famous, well known, actors, Hollywood. Yep, Hollywood. Yes, sir. Possession. Possession stuff. Feel free to be as specific as you want. What's that? Oh, yeah, substance abuse, drugs and alcohol, you know. Uh, I was just talking to a physician recently about drugs and, and the way that they were describing it to me. We were talking about drug abuse and some of the things that I've had to deal with as a pastor. And they were saying, once some of these drugs, once you get high only one time, you'll never get it again like that. And that a lot of people will get addicted because they're just trying to feel that one more time. But they can't get it. And so they'll increase, increase, increase. Overdosing is very easy to do because people are just trying to feel happy again. For sure, yeah. Drugs, alcohol, yeah. Anybody else? Bill? Entertainment, good. Absolutely. We spend probably more time in entertainment than we ever do in our lifetime studying the Word of God, for sure. Yes, ma'am? What's that? Power. Oh, power. I thought you said hour. I'm like, no, I'm not going to preach that long today, Lord willing. <laughs> power. Yeah, absolutely. If I have authority over everybody else around me, I've arrived, that makes me more valuable. Probably at self-awareness, right? If I can just be at peace with myself. If I can just learn, how many times have you heard this in the world? You have to learn to love yourself before you can ever be happy. And yet when I read the Bible, that's not what I see. I see a completely different message. No honest deer hunters in here want to talk about the 14 or 18 point buck. Brother Dale, how, what was, was your 17? 17 point buck. I'm telling you guys, if I shot a 17 point buck, I'd be very happy. And anytime I'm not, it's because I haven't shot a 17 point buck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there you go. Just, it's, it's the buck. It's around the corner. If I can just shoot it, I'll be happy. Anybody else want to be a little more specific? Especially here in the state of Michigan? A 70 degree day in the middle of December. <laughs> Weather makes me unhappy. Yeah, Noah, I thought I saw your hand go up. Sports? Oh, for sure. Absolutely. That's a great one. If only, Brother Mike, if only the Lions could win a Super Bowl. He and I have talked about what would happen in the, in the state of Michigan and in Detroit if the Lions won a Super Bowl. Stay inside your homes. That's what happens if the Lions win a Super Bowl. And I think right now, 
the standard is make it to the playoffs. If only the Lions could make it to the playoffs. Remember the good old days with the Russian Five and the Red Wings? And oh, were those, my life was so good when the, when the Red Wings were winning the cup. And if only my team would win, I'd be happy. All these things. And yet, isn't it true what Nathaniel Hawthorne said? Go looking for happiness, and it's like trying to chase a wild goose down. Best of luck to you. And from his perspective, the effort put forth trying to find happiness never seems to match those who are. From his perspective, it's confusing. Those who are happy seem to almost be happy on accident because it's not from their effort that they're so happy. I have so many common interests with so many of you. I look in your faces and I can connect with every last one of you. Just one more model airplane. Just one more firearm. Just one limit during duck season. I got one more hand, yes. Retirement, Retirement, you know? Cherry and I were a part of a skit years ago at a couple's retreat. And we were supposed to represent the college age kid. So my wife and I are married and we're the busy ones. And then they had another couple in the church who had children. And then another couple that was of retirement age. And they had each one of us complain, what's the worst part about your life right now? And so we got up there and said, oh man, we just don't ever have any time. We were so busy. We can't do all the things we want to do. And then the married couple got up and said, man, with our kids, we're just so busy with the kids. We just never have any time to do. And then the retired couple got up and said, man, I thought my life would be calm and better and and no longer complicated, that I wouldn't have to fight and struggle every day. And yet every area of my life I'm fighting. And I thought it would be calm and peaceful, but I'm more busy now than I was when I was working. And I remember as a college kid looking up and saying, man, is that delusional thinking? (laughs) Just got to get to retirement and then everything will be easy. But I've known enough of you to know life is never easy. Not even retirement. And so here's a question. How do you find happiness? The title of the message today is Finding Joy. Acts chapter 16. Um, Paul and Silas are they're in Philippi, which is the northern coast northeast coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, they cast out a demon out of a girl under the authority of Jesus, and it makes the people that were making money off of her abilities very angry. They accuse Paul and Silas in verse 21 publicly. They teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. The multitude in verse 22 rose up against, uh, together against them, Paul and Silas, And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Verse 23, and when they had laid many stripes upon them. Laid many stripes. That's the same beating that Jesus took before he was crucified. You with me? They cast them into prison, changing, uh, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inter-prison, made their feet fast in the stocks. Verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. What kind of joy is this? having laid stripes on them. Obviously, their flesh was torn open with each strike. But then those stripes never went away. Paul talked about them later when he was writing to the church in Rome about how mutilated his body had been, much of it because of the beating that he took in Philippi. And then, of course, they're not given over to medical care after that beating. They're thrown into a prison cell and chained. And the two are sitting there. And what are some of the thoughts that you could have having tried to share Jesus with the world and just got ripped to pieces? Number one, this is never going to work. Number two, God has forsaken us. How could God say he loves us but let us get beaten this badly? I mean, it, it sounds like a story to us, but when you start living it in your own life, you can start connecting to some of the experiences that you've had where you start to think that God doesn't care. And yet they pray, 
and then they sing praises. Why? Now, the simple, straightforward answer, which we all know and live, is because they have Jesus. But here's the question, how does that work? Why is it that they're happy after being beaten in jail? I want you to see the life of Jesus. Remember last week we talked about one of the Psalms having bookends to it, Psalm 139? Well, I want you to see the bookends of the life of Jesus. Go to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, the opening of Matthew chapter 2 is talking about uh, the wise men seeking out the birth of Jesus. They had seen his star, they had seen his coming, and now they're pursuing him. By the time they get to him, you know, theologians estimate that Jesus, based on how much, you know, how, how much travel they had to do, how many miles they could do per day, meeting with Herod, when they saw the star, all of those things, and so it's estimated that they came to Jesus when he was either one or two years old, probably closer to two years old, by the time they finally found the master. And so uh, verse 9, after they get done speaking with Herod, when they had heard the king, they departed, lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. The word young child kind of tips us off that Jesus is no longer a newborn. Verse 11, when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. They fell down and worshipped him. When they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country and went another way. Look at verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Go to the end of the book of Matthew. There's 28 chapters in Matthew. Let's see the bookend of the life of Jesus. Matthew chapter 28. How does Jesus' life end? Not a trick question. <laughs> this is like, you know, you're the student that sat in the back in school and you were always waiting for that easy one so you could actually answer a question correctly when the teacher asked it. That was me. It's like, you'd be listening. You'd be like, I don't know the answer to that one. I know, I know the answer to that one. And you throw your hand up, but everybody does. That's the kind of question I'm asking right now. How did Jesus' life end? With the crucifixion. Yeah. Okay, you're with me. So how could the Bible end happily? How could the life of Jesus in the book of Matthew end happily? Because that's how his life ended, but that's not the end of his story. So in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus raises from the dead. And in verse 8, we see the reception that he gets and you can see the similarity to the beginning of his life. They departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' words. Stay with me. I'm showing you something that you probably never realized about joy before. Because right at the beginning of this sermon, I'm going to show you the absolute secret to joy. And then we'll spend the rest of the time trying to figure out why it is that we lose it. So from there, you see the bookends in Matthew. Now let's look at them in Luke. Go to Luke chapter 2. The other place where we have the birth of Jesus. I think you can kind of figure out where this is going. Luke chapter 2, verse 8, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. The glory of the Lord shone round about them. What's their response? Again, another question. If you're just with me a little bit, you'll be able to answer this one. 
The end of verse 9 tells us how they responded when the angels came, the same way you would if you've never seen an angel before. How did they respond? Yeah, sore afraid. Another way to say it in today's colloquial language is terrified. They were terrified. And the angels who came said, nope, wrong response. There are times to be afraid of God, and there are times to be excited. You missed it. I don't want you to be scared. So what do they say in verse 10? And the angel said unto them, fear not, knock it off. That's the wrong response. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Prophecy is real, and God is in the flesh. He's come to save us. And so then let's go to the close of the book of Luke. Go to Luke chapter 24 and see the bookend of his life again. This constant theme of joy is going to lead us to the source of it for our lives. Luke chapter 24. Verse 50, and he led them out as far as to Bethany. He lifted up his hands and he blessed them. And it came to pass that while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Now, wouldn't that be sad when Jesus leaves? Think about this. God in flesh comes. He dies in a way no one's expecting. But then, twist of the plot three days later, he raises from the dead. Yes! And then he spends some time with them and then says, okay, I'm gone and you're not going to see me again until you die. See you later. If you're a disciple, he'd be like, oh, this is such a bummer. I want you to imagine, I stand up in front of the church and I say, you guys, God's been moving in my heart for a long, long time and I just wanted to stay here and I can't. God has moved and there's another church that's called me and I have to leave. How would you all feel? By the way, this is not a secret reveal party, okay? Don't freak out. No one else wants me, so you're stuck with me, okay? How would you feel? And I'm far from perfect. And I've far from been a perfect friend for you. And so he's leaving. He's leaving. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them, carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him. They returned to Jerusalem with great joy. What on earth is going on? Nathaniel Hawthorne looks at this and says, they accidentally found it because this isn't natural. No one ever gets happy like this. And so the question is, how can I be happy? Go back to John chapter 15. Of course, we have John chapter 15, verses 1 through 10, where Jesus says, abide in me. Now, if you don't know what that means, some of you may think you don't know what it means, but you just didn't realize it was this simple. And so let me explain to you what it means to abide in Jesus. Because remember, he talks about being purged, but then immediately after that, he says, you are cleansed by the words that I speak to you. And what are the words? If you try to be good enough to earn favor with God, you will never be able to do it. He even warns so far as to say that if you try to earn favor with God by good behavior, you'll be cut off and thrown in a furnace. Because the only way you can be approved in front of the Father is to abide in Jesus. No one is going to be allowed into the kingdom because they were good enough. Only those who have put their faith and trust and confidence that Jesus said, ask and I'll forgive you can come. The only reason I'll get to go to heaven is because Jesus died for me when I should have died for me. And when I was seven years old, I repented of that sin which tore me from God. And since then, I've been his child. And I continue to be his child because when Jesus died on the cross, he said it is finished, meaning he had fully paid for my sins. And everything that I am as you look at me, as a dad, Lucas, this morning, picked up the nameplate that someone had given me years ago for my desk when people were struggling to call me pastor. They were just calling me by my first name. 
someone went, they, that, that's not okay, he's pastor, call him pastor. So they actually had a name thing made up, it says Pastor Troy Boudreau, and I had to put it on my desk. And Lucas picked it up, and he said, don't you have a third name? And I, Lucas, there are three names right there. He goes, don't you have a third name? And I'm like, yeah, what are you talking about? He goes, well, this says Pastor Troy Boudreau, but don't you have another one? I was like, yeah, John. John's my middle name. So those are all the names that I have. And he pipes in, he goes, and Daddy. Pretty cute, you know? It's pretty cute. So I have Pastor Troy, John, Boudreau, Daddy. I got five names. John, because I'm a grandson. Troy, because I'm a son and a husband. Pastor, because I get to be a shepherd. Boudreau, we won't talk about that part. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Everybody's family's got it, right? But uh, half French, half Finnish, and born in the Upper Peninsula, I'm a Boudreau. Got a lot of people that are lovely people in my family and got some history there that isn't that great, but I'm a Boudreau. And what was the one that I didn't say, Daddy? All of these names mean something because of Jesus in my life. None of it is because of who I am. All of it is because of who he is. That's what it means to abide in Jesus. And if you have never chosen to abide in Jesus this way, then you're not a child of God. But if you listen to what he says and you abide in him, Jesus says, you're clean. Well, how's that possible? Because as he died on the cross, he took our sins on himself. That's what Isaiah 53 says. He had borne our iniquities and carried our sorrows on his back. He was bruised, he was smitten, he was rejected of God, and yet he's our king. And Jesus says, abide in me. You say, well, okay, well, what does it mean when you do? Well, first of all, get your standing right. Ask him to forgive you if you have it. Second, love him. How could you possibly receive that good of a sacrifice and not love him for it? To say that I don't love Jesus and I'm benefiting from his cross is one of the greatest abominations ever said from a mouth. It really is. And it's one of the greatest abominations ever lived from a life. To be in possession of the gospel and then act like he's not worthy of any affection. Simply stated, what's wrong with you? And if I can state it more plainly, I think it's a big problem for a lot of people. Because the gospel is nothing but a story. In fact, we know that it's not when you're in revival, when you're on fire, and when you're not on fire, you have forgotten what he did. And he says, love me. Like, I've loved you. And then love each other too the same way. That's what, if you abide in me, in other words, if the gospel matters, if me dying on the cross matters for you, you'll love me. So love me, because I love you. And if you want to prove that you love me, love other people, because that's what I want you to do. Because love isn't what you feel, it's the sacrifices you make. So love. And then he says, follow my instruction. If you say you love me, then you'll want to do the things that, that I ask you to do, almost as though Jesus knew that we misunderstand love. How many times have we said, I fell in love? I fell in love with the Green Bay Packers at a very early age. I fell in love with my girl in Sunday school class, but I had to wait till we were old enough to get married. How many times have you heard someone say, we fell out of love? That is not God's definition of love. Love is that beautiful poetic word which describes self-sacrifice from one person to another that doesn't deserve it. That's what love is. It should be easy to love God because he's worthy of it. But the real test comes when we got to love people that aren't. Love is a choice. Now, are you with me so far? Well, all we have done is laid the first course of bricks. That's all we've done. It's the first course. By the way, as a born-again Christian, if you ever forget these things, it's first course. What do you think is going to happen to the building if that first course is no good? I got a man who dedicated his life to bricklaying. Brother Bob, can you easily straighten a wall when the first course has been laid crooked? So set the first course. Children of God, visit your salvation all of the time. Do it every day. Every day, remember, how did Jesus save me? What were the people? 
what did they say? Who were the people that God used to bring me to this place? When's the last time you actually just stopped and thought, man, I remember when I asked Jesus to save me, and you wonder why you have no joy? Because I'm going to show you all that Jesus has to offer right now. And it's not the way you'd expect. See, our expectation is we come into the world and we're miserable. And then we stay miserable until we find the right additions that bring happiness with them. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible, Jesus says in John chapter 3, you must be born again. And later on, in Paul's epistles, he says, any man that is in Christ is a new creature. New creature. In Ephesians chapter 4, he says, live as a new man, not as the old man. That is to say, yes, you may be born into the world, not naturally happy, but that's not the natural state of the child of God. He says it this way in John chapter 15. It's opposite of what you're thinking. You're thinking, I need to add the Bible to my life, and I need to add prayer to my life, and I need to add more church to my life, and then I'll be happy. Nope, doesn't work that way. Happiness isn't something that you bring in. It's something that Jesus brought with him. That's why when he came into the world, the angels said, celebrate great joy. And when he left, they're celebrating because he's changed them completely. He says it this way in John chapter 15, verse number 11. And only the master could say it this way. All the words that I try to compile fail, but when I read them from what he says, it all makes perfect sense. John chapter 15, verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you. Are there a couple words that stand out to you there? How about the word my? Whose joy is it? Okay, so you're not going to find it in yourself. Did you hear me? You are not going to find this kind of joy in yourself. People that have learned to love themselves have learned to lie to themselves because no one is perfect. Everyone has blemishes. I'm comfortable with myself because God loves me, not because I do. This is what he says. My joy might remain in you. The word remain. What does that mean? What does it mean if it remains? What's that? It's already there. Did you hear that? It remains. That means it's there forever. Child of God, the joy is already there. You say, no, it's not. Yes, it is. It really is. You just don't think it is. Let's finish reading, and then I'm going to explain all of this to you in a way that's going to just completely change the way that you think happiness is found as a born-again Christian. This is what Jesus says. And if it doesn't make sense, then argue with the master's lips today. Because he says, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Having a relationship with me, abiding in me and walking with me is how you have joy. And if you want it to be filled, make sure that you and I are right all of the time. And if you and I aren't right, you are selling your joy off at a very cheap price. Tell me that it's not completely opposite to everything you've ever thought of in your life when it comes to being happy. I just need a little bit more house. We just need a bigger church building. I just need a newer car. I just need a bigger buck. I just need a little property up north that I can call my own where I can run away from my problems. I just need a boat. No one says that anymore, right? Right? Mike and I were talking about this, and he just purchased a, a, a vessel for going duck hunting. And he goes, well, you know what they say. You two best days of your life. The first is when you buy your boat, and the second best is when you sell your boat. I now have a boat. It's like, yeah, that's the right way to think, right? Any possession takes more of you. It doesn't take less of you. It doesn't add to your life. It takes away from your life. Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 6. He says, you guys are adding all kinds of things to your life that rust, so you know what you're doing. You're adding rust to your life. You're adding, you know, stuff for people to break in and steal. It's great when you don't have much because no one wants to steal from you. Really, I've had vehicles where it's like, did you lock your car? Like, why? 
No one looks at that car and says, I think I'll take that thing to downtown Detroit. They look at that and says, I don't think it'll make it to downtown Detroit. The number one stolen car in the United States of America right now is brand new Dodge Chargers. Why? Because everybody wants them because they think they're cool. You will never be happy by adding. It's not the way it works. So you say, okay, then why am I not happy? When we bought our house, the water had been turned off because it had gone through foreclosure and we bought it, tried to buy it on a short sale, ended up buying our home from the bank directly in foreclosure. And so the water had been off for a long time. And we didn't know if it had been winterized correctly or not. So I had to call the water company out and I met with them. A guy came uh, to turn the water back on. And when he turned the water back on, we went in the house and uh, turned the valve open to the house. He had to turn it on outside. Then we came in and we turned the valve on in the house. And so he goes, okay, try a faucet. And I had a faucet spigot right there and I opened it up and there was like nothing coming out, nothing. I'm like, man, what is going on? He goes, that's weird. Try, a, try, a, try one of the faucets upstairs. So I ran upstairs while he stayed down and I opened it up and he's standing there. I yelled down, I said, there's nothing, not even a drop. So I came running back down. He goes, man, this is weird. And we're looking at the meter and I said, why is the meter running? And he goes, I don't know, I can't figure it out. He goes, is there any water running in the house anywhere? I'm like, no, nowhere. He goes, are you sure? I said, there's nothing running anywhere. He goes, man, this is weird. Let's go upstairs and take a look. So we went upstairs again and we look all over upstairs. No faucets are open. We go back down, we look, and he's like, man, it's got to be coming from somewhere. I said, I guess I'll go outside and look. So I went outside to go check the faucets, and the main line coming into the house had a pressure cap on it so that if the pipes froze, the pressure cap would blow instead of the pipes blowing. Turns out the house hadn't been winterized correctly because that cap was gone, and we were blowing all the pressure the city had to offer, which was awesome, straight up into the air and into the yard. I had this much water in my side yard, standing water. I had no pressure inside because it was all being stolen before it could get to me. There are areas in our life that if we don't keep them tuned, most importantly, our relationship with Jesus, it's not that we haven't obtained joy, it's that we're blowing our joy out the side of our life. And there are many different areas where joy can be stolen, but I want to just show you for sake of time, three major categories today where joy can be stolen out of our lives. And we're going to look at the life of Jesus. We'll call them parasites. But sometimes you think, oh, a parasite is just this tiny little thing that comes in and makes you a little sick. And so just know that the kind of parasites we're talking about are the kind that suck all of the life out of you. It's the kind where you find out not a drop of water has been making it in the house because it's all being stolen and blown out into the yard. Three parasites in our life that can steal joy. Because the fact is, we don't go get joy and bring it into our lives. Jesus brought joy with him. And as long as we protect that, we will be happy. And if we don't protect it, we won't. Some of you are having a hard time believing that it's this simple. But if you learn to live with just these three categories tightened up tight, you'd be happier than you ever thought possible. Because in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, we are told that one of the fruits of the Spirit, that is, because God's Spirit dwells inside of us, we will produce many things, and one of them is joy. That's not something you do or act or achieve. It's something that happens when you know you're right with God. And if you're wondering, why does it work this way? It's because you were designed this way. That's what God meant of many things when he said, let us make man in our image. Do you think God, in general terms, in his nature, is an unhappy person? He made snowflakes. That, as far as I know, mathematically can never be repeated. He made rainbows. He made kangaroos. For us, it's like a kangaroo? My boy just loves animals. God made duck-billed platypuses. Tell me that God doesn't love to have fun. Right? And if horses weren't enough, he made zebras. And if white-tailed deer weren't enough, he made elk and moose. My God is a happy God. It's who he is. And all you have to do is look at creation. Flower blossoms, cherry blossoms, lilac bushes when the walleye are running. Man, my father is a happy God. And he's made us in our image. You see, that joy is there, but we're not experiencing it because... We're giving it away. We're leeching it out in some major categories. 
Let's dive into the first one. I don't think we need to take a lot of time. These are going to bite pretty hard. So the longer I take, the more sore you'll be when you leave. So we'll just try to keep it moving if we can. The first one is a follow-up on last week's message. Go to Isaiah chapter 59. I guess really if you're taking notes, the sermon kind of breaks down into two major parts. What is joy and then how do we lose it? So joy is being right with God. Joy is what happens when God renews his creation to what he originally designed us to be. You say, how do we lose it? There's three areas I'm going to show you where you can lose it. And then I would love for you to dig into your life and find other areas where you're leaking your joy. That's what it means to have the Holy Spirit as a counselor teaching you all things. But in Isaiah 59, we are introduced to the first major parasite where we lose more joy than in any other category. Verse 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. What a great way to say it. God's hand isn't too short for my reach. I've drifted too far. You don't know how far I've gone. And I'm just beyond God's reach. Really? You think God's arm is short? No one would ever describe God's reach as short. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. That's salvation. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. You can't sin with one hand and ask for help with the other. Parasite number one that'll take your joy is the parasite of sin. It's just that simple. No man who has ever dug deep into sin can be described as a happy man. No one. And I wish we had time, but you can go through Old Testament characters and see men that were in sin that were miserable over and over and over again. A really great story in the Old Testament. You remember Achan in the book of Joshua who hid the gold underneath his tent? Why? Because if I add to my life, I'll be happy. Wrong. You just gave up your joy. And now we have to take you and your family and put you away because of the damage you caused to these other families that are now grieving. See, when you start leeching out your joy through sin, you take other people's joy as well. It's this parasite that'll not only feed on your being, but rapidly and easily attach to any other people because sin will beget sin. Can't tell you how many times I've been talking with a person that's trying to break a sin cycle and, and comes to identify their sin as a chain from their father or their mother. Chain after chain of sin. Who could ever break the chain of sin? No man but Jesus can. Sin is a parasite and it will destroy your life. I talked about it at length last week. Don't answer me, don't raise your hand, but I wonder how many actually followed up with the message and did a time in your life of confession. Isn't it good when you come out of confession? Man, I am right with God. What happened? You just got rid of a parasite. That's a taste of it, of joy. When you come up and you're like, I am completely right with God. And if you can't connect with it at all, I can tell you why. It's because you didn't repent and confess it all this last week. You didn't do what your pastor said you ought to do, and that's confess. And that's fine, that's your choice, but don't get angry at the church or God because you're miserable when you're not following instruction. It's being laid out in front of you. It's like the mechanic says, you've got to change your oil every 6,000 miles. And you come in at 80,000 miles and you say, my engine is blown. And he says, well, yeah. When's the last time you changed your oil? It's tar coming out of the drain plug. Oh, I forgot you're supposed to do that. Who's to blame? Don't blame the church. Don't blame your wife. You, sir, should have brought your vehicle in and gotten your oil changed. Life requires maintenance. Spirituality requires maintenance. If you have spent zero time confessing any sin in your life, there is no way you were that perfect this last week. You are now living with parasites in your life. Get right with God. All the hard work's already been done. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. And for some of you, you're actively living in sin. You're like, but I just don't want to give it up because then I'll be, what, unhappy? (laughs) It's the reason you're not happy. 
We look at drugs and we say, oh, who would ever do drugs? That's what sin is. It's a drug to human nature. I did it once and oh, it felt so good. Now I got to do it again. It didn't feel as good as it did the first time. Maybe I'll do it again. Only this time I'll go bigger. Because it just didn't make me feel the same way it did the first time. Yeah, that's right, because it was artificial. That's what sin is. Did you know that when a mosquito lands on you, a lot of times you don't feel it because the first thing they do is inject you with a saliva that helps you not feel it? Did you know that? One of the reasons I feel mosquitoes land on me is because when they land on me, the first thing they do before they put their spit in you to thin out your blood, because think about it, what would happen if that little tube got a clot in it? He'd go out all plugged up, wouldn't he? So they spit into you. It's got a little bit of a blood thinner in it, and it's got a little bit of a, you don't feel this, you're okay, which, by the way, your body eventually realizes, hey, this is venom. And you get that little bump and all that scratching, that's because it puts something in you. It's a parasite. It comes in offering great praise, wonderful experiences, and you realize it's stealing from me. Some of you have... Mosquitoes, when you swat them, you're going to have a blood splat that's just very large. It's been sucking on you for a while. I mean, you're going to have to go through a cleaning up process because you hit that thing, you're like, oh man, that was a mess. That was there for quite a while. But oh, that we would be so sensitive that when a mosquito comes just poking, looking for a spot to find some blood, right away you're like, get off of me. What if we lived that way in, when it came to the world of sin? The second sin, sin comes creeping around, you're so tender and aware of it, you're like, get off of me. I'm that guy, man, a mosquito comes on me, I'm swatting it before it ever gets to suck even a fraction of an ounce, even a gram, it doesn't happen. I mean, get off of me. If I have one wood tick on me from hunting, I lay all night like this with all the hair on my body crawling, you know? That's me. But I got eaten up this last deer season when I went out at the beginning of bow season because there were deer on the field and I didn't even notice. I got the first mosquito bites I've gotten in years because I was so distracted. Man, sin is a parasite that wants to come and eat you alive. For some of you, it's not a big sin that's like hemorrhaging. It's a bunch of little ones all over you and you're ill spiritually. And you had a chance from the message last week to get right with Jesus and you didn't do it. But you're confused as to why you're not happy and you think, I just got to get a raise. That'll make me happy. I wrote this down and I hesitate to read this because I, I think the Holy Spirit does a far better job of identifying sin in our lives, but I'm growing a little tired of speaking in vague terms. And so I'll be specific to sin that I've experienced uh, both in my own life or in other people's lives. And I just wrote down some of the things that people are struggling with. Your music choices are terrible, and they are the smallest of all your sin problems. Some of you haven't read or studied the Bible in years. Some of you are bitter and angry every day. That is to say, you sit in the seat of the redeemed, but you cut redemption and forgiveness off from everyone in your life. Your mouth is a cesspool of vulgarities. No matter how good you act, anger will wring profanity out of your mouth in an unstoppable and startling fashion. You love stuff more than you would ever love Jesus. It's one of the reasons you refuse to honor the Lord with giving to him, because it's like he's stealing from you. Some of you will grab looks when you think no one will catch you, and you are an adulterer in mind and heart all day, every day. You lie, you steal, you puff up in a mirror because you always think about yourself first. And you, sir, you ma'am are miserable. Sin is a problem, it's not a solution. And it's stealing a lot of joy. You see the significance of a parasite? Good, that means we can pick up speed. There's two more yet. I wrote out the perceived failures of Jesus for parasite number two. Parasite number two is the parasite of insecurity. What are the perceived failures of Jesus? As a king, he was disgraced. Catch these. As a king, he was disgraced. As a teacher, he was rejected. As a friend, he was betrayed. As a savior, he was slain. 
He died around the age of 33 with 11 faithful followers. He was betrayed by one of his closest and forsaken by almost everyone else. And he knew all of this was going to happen before it happened. And yet he says in John chapter 15, I got joy. And I got enough to fill you with joy. You say, how is that possible? How could the God of the universe come and be so ill successful in his life and still be happy? Because if you haven't caught it, success doesn't bring happiness. But when you find out what your identity in God is, nothing can touch it. Not anyone's opinion of you, including your own. I want to show it to you in Matthew chapter 3. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you would say, I'm an insecure person? <laughs> don't raise your hand. You don't, you don't need to embarrass yourself. Just know that probably almost every hand would go in the air, and the ones that didn't might not be telling the truth. It's something we struggle with because we haven't been made new yet. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him, but John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. Comest thou to me? Amen. Amen. If you didn't catch what just happened, Jesus asked John, would you please baptize me? And he goes, me? Baptize you? Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. There's nothing that I can do for you. I need you to do for me. How stunning it is when God comes into your life and says, I need you. How flattering it is when God comes into your life and says, I need you. And so the most flattering compliment Jesus could pay John is, you've been baptizing faithfully, and I need you to do it for me. And John says, no, 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 you're the master. I, I need you to baptize me. Jesus answering in verse 15 said unto him, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Did you, this is what, it, this is a really great way to say this. Dads, have you ever said this? because I said so. That's what Jesus says to John. Jesus comes and says, baptize me. And John goes, me baptize you. You're the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. No, I need you to baptize me. And Jesus says, no, you do it. I said so. It is on us to fulfill all righteousness. This has to happen. Don't ever be angry at the Romans that nailed Jesus to the cross because it was the fulfillment of righteousness. Don't ever carry bitterness in your heart because Judas betrayed Jesus. All of these things must be so that righteousness could be fulfilled. It was always God's will. That doesn't mean the betrayal was good or that the Romans nailing God to the cross was good. It means that God did something incredible. And it was very expensive to do. Verse 15, then he suffered him. And the word suffer doesn't mean he put him in a headlock and threw him under the water. It means he did what he said. He, he listened to what Jesus said because Jesus spoke with authority. Oh, that God could step into your life and speak with that kind of authority. Because I said so. Sin's got to go. Well, why? Because I said so. Yes, God, I'll suffer you. Well, whatever you say. Submission is the very reason most people never find happiness. Verse 16, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, lighting upon him. Verse 17 closes out the chapter in perfect fashion. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Whether he was betrayed by Judas only picked up 11 guys to follow him, was rejected as a teacher, was kicked out and made fun of as a king. No matter what happened to Jesus, we have God's opinion of him. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Did you know that sometimes the world is going to completely miss God's opinion of you? They're going to think you're something other than what God thinks of you. So here's the question. What does God think of you? Let's stop with this one statement. 
worthy enough to die for. I don't have to be okay with myself, and I don't need you to be okay with me. Because you know what I found out? God is. He's not just okay with me. He loves me. He doesn't just love me. He was slaughtered for me. And so you say what you want, and you say what you want, and you say what you want, but it shouldn't change my understanding of myself because I know what God said about me. And I realize this is hard to live because sometimes in your ear is the one person you thought would never say it. Behold, you'll never hear that from God. Even Satan in your ear trying to convince you that you can't be saved, you can't be redeemed, and Jesus crying out from the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It is finished. A lot of people have had a a lot of opinions of me. I'm glad God knew what he was doing because on a personal personality profile based on the job and the personality, I was not a match for the pastorate. Sure, I can stand up and speak in front of people, but... Part of, having, part of being a pastor is you really need to have a tender heart. Some pastors, they get toughened hearts, and then they end up kind of stepping on their sheep because their heart has gotten hard. Well, I can tell you how a pastor's heart gets hard. It's because he's been treated very, very, very poorly. And I can't tell you how many times through tears I have had to tell God, I'm going to give up what they just said about me. Make me to be like Jesus, and if that's what you're doing, I just need to be okay with it. Part of this job is is being publicly criticized constantly. Sometimes I'm praised, sometimes I'm given gifts, but believe me when I say the kindness that's shown will never outweigh the pain that a pastor experiences ever. But I know why I keep doing what I'm doing. Because you guys, he had me on his mind when his blood was pumping out with every heartbeat. And you know what he said to himself? That Troy John Boudreaux is worth all of this. Now I can argue that it isn't, but he did it already. That's my value. You say whatever you want to say, but when I get in front of God, he's going to declare my value and he's going to say, welcome home. And I may have some critics that'll be saying, man, he shouldn't be allowed into heaven. And God will say, are you kidding me? We have been waiting for him. You weren't here when we celebrated when he was seven years old and he asked Jesus to save him. We threw the biggest party heaven's ever seen when he did that. We have been waiting for him to come. Mind your own business. I have my opinion of him, and yours doesn't affect mine. I'm God of the universe. Insecurity is a parasite that can take away our joy. All we need to do is focus on what Jesus says about us. Number three, finally, and this is a very real one. Go to John chapter 12. I was uh, talking to someone on the phone last night in our church family. We were catching up with each other, and um, one, of, uh, one of our church family came up in the conversation, one of our nurses came up in the conversation, and I want to embarrass that person right now. I probably wouldn't mind I'm looking right at you. I'm not going to embarrass you right now, but uh, for sake of the video on the internet, we don't need to put it out there. Um, And this person I was talking to said, you know, in all of this, my heart just breaks for this person. And it just makes me so upset. Because one of our nurses, who has been working for the same healthcare system for years and has been helping to battle COVID, is losing her job because she refuses to give up her free choice, her freedom. And so they are firing her. In fact, she already punched out and had her last day. And when this person I was talking to on the phone said, my heart just breaks for her, I said, don't, mine doesn't. And it sounded so heartless, like, really? I'm like, you need to talk to her. That's what you need to do. Because she has been set free. She is energized. She's going bonkers. She's meeting people and getting to talk to people that she never thought she would. God has now taken complete control of her entire life. And what's best about it is she's serving him and not getting paid for it. 
This is the best part. I said, believe me, talk to her. She's not brokenhearted or miserable. Is she disappointed? Is she frustrated? Yeah. But is she reeling and hurting? Nope. Don't feel bad for her. Why? Because you would think in the context of trying to find happiness, losing your job would be everything. Parasite number three, John chapter 12. Joy can be unconditional in the context of opposition. John chapter 12, verse number 23. Jesus answering said, The hour is come that the Son of Man be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat shall fall to the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He's talking about how he's going to have to give his life. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall find it. It's the exact opposite. It's how you find joy. Try and make yourself happy, you'll be miserable. Start pushing it all away and realize what's in you and you'll find joy. Is what he says. And when does he say this? Verse 27, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, for this cause came I unto this hour. The parasite of opposition. Opposition can steal your joy if you let it. Because what does opposition cause us to do? Opposition causes us to doubt. Yes? You doubt the mission. You doubt your rightness. You doubt your ability. You begin to doubt because someone's attacking you, trying to convince you that it's not possible. And Satan is there saying it's not possible. There's no way that you're right. I know you did this and this and this for the ministry and no one even noticed. That's not worth it. Opposition can steal your joy if you start listening to bad counsel. In Nehemiah, we won't take time, but in Nehemiah chapter 6, they'll finish with a, a cute story and we'll be done. But in Nehemiah chapter 6, you remember the book of Nehemiah opens up in Nehemiah chapter 1, and he's, he's, a guy comes to him, and Nehemiah says, hey, how's Jerusalem looking? He goes, oh, it's destroyed. The holy city of God is destroyed. And Nehemiah breaks down and cries, and then he prays, God, what can I do? And he says, for I was the cupbearer to the king. He goes to the king, and he says, hey, you know I'm a Jew. He goes, yeah, of course. I own you. <laughs> I know where you came from. And he goes, well, you know, I've been loyal to you, and I just have a request. The king says, what do you need? I love you. You've been good to me, and I'll be good to you. And you, you check all my food every day, and you're willing to die to protect me. What do you need? Man, when the world sees us live in a godly fashion, we will have their attention. It might be one of the reasons the church doesn't have their attention, because we don't look that much different than them a lot of times. Should the church look different than the world? Oh, my, yes. Everything should be different. So, Nehemiah says, well, you know where I, where I lived? We have a capital city. It's Jerusalem. Yeah, I'm familiar with Jerusalem. King, it's been ripped to pieces. Would you allow me to go work on it? Yeah. Yeah, I don't mind if you do that. Go ahead, take a break. You've been protecting me. I'm happy to help you out. You got supplies? No. Well, you're going to need supplies. Here, I'll give you a letter so you can get anything you need. You need help? Yeah, it's going to be a big project, and I don't know who's there that's going to help. That's fine. I'll send people with you. Okay, thank you. He goes there. He's got the blessing of the king. Everything's going to go awesome, and what happens? Sanballat Sam and Tobiah, who are benefiting from raiding Jerusalem every night, can't stand the work that's being done. And so they come attacking. Every night, every day, while they're trying to build the wall, Nehemiah's drummed up these volunteers and they're working one stone at a time trying to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. A massive task. They're not just making a fence for their yard. They're building walls for a city. And it got so bad that they had to keep their sword in one hand and put stones on the other because they wanted to be attacked and killed all the time by their enemies. This is the way that they fought. Then we get to Nehemiah chapter 6 and Sanballat and Tobiah realize, oh great, they're over halfway done. These guys aren't going to quit. We've tried. We've done everything we can think of. They're going to build it. So you know what? Let's stop fighting them. Let's make friends of them. Because we can't stop them, and they're going to dominate. As soon as, if they can do this, then we want to be a part. Satan will take out more believers acting like a friend than he ever would an enemy. It's true. 
Complacency and comfort is one of the worst places a Christian can be. Hence, Paul and Silas in the jail of Philippi singing praises to God. And so, Sandal and Tobiah come to Nehemiah and they say, hey, we want to we take you out. Let's go eat. For real. Let's, let's go eat. And we could talk about uh, maybe forming an alliance. What do you think of that? And you know what Nehemiah's answer was? It's so awesome. This is what he says. I am doing a good work. I cannot come down. Why should the work cease? Parasites of opposition, they come in all sorts of forms, but all they want you to do is stop doing what you're doing. Anything to get you to stop doing what you're doing. But let me say this, if you are serving the master and you are loving him, you are doing a good work. Don't stop for anything. Not for anyone's opinion, not for Satan himself. Don't stop. I'm doing a good work. I will not come down. Years ago, years and years ago, maybe a name that you're familiar with, uh, a story involving Yogi Berra, well-known uh, catcher from the New York Yankees, and Hank Aaron, who at the time was the chief power hitter for the Milwaukee Braves. The teams were playing in the World Series, and as usual, Yogi Berra was keeping up his ceaseless chatter as catcher, intended to pep out his teammates on the one hand and distract the Milwaukee batters on the other. As Aaron came to the plate, Yogi tried to distract him by saying, Henry, you're holding the bat wrong. You're supposed to hold it so you can read the trademark. That's pretty clever, isn't it? Get you thinking about the bat instead of the ball. Aaron didn't say anything, but when the next pitch came, he hit it to the left field bleachers right out of the park. After rounding the bases and taking up home plate, Aaron stopped, looked at Yogi Berra, and said, I didn't come here to read. I didn't come here to be rich. I didn't come here to be powerful. I didn't come here to be well-known. I came here to show Jesus I love you and I will not quit. I am doing a good work and I will not come down. Not for sin, not for other people's opinions, and not because you don't want me to do it anymore. I won't quit. And here's what I found. I'm happy even with all my health problems, the Lord has given me joy. Identify those parasites. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved or how godly you are. Those parasites can come and take all your joy away. If you're an unhappy person, I will tell you what your problem is. Jesus isn't dominating your life because he's here to bring joy. Heads bowed and eyes closed as I pray. I hope you'll start thinking about how you want to respond today. Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing us joy. Lord, it's a message that requires the Holy Spirit to convince our hearts. For some are so far from the first days of their salvation, they have forgotten what it was like to be brand new, born again, and truly happy. But for those of us that can remember, that can recall our salvation as though it was yesterday, Father, we know what happy looks like. And so would you please right now show us the parasites that are in our life. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Let's stand to your feet. We're going to close the service with an invitation, but I want to give you a chance to respond. Years ago, when we started the church, I processed and read a bunch of stuff on how to do invitations, because I wanted to make sure that the way we did it was right. Sometimes people haven't liked the way I've done invitations. It's one of those things. It's kind of what you're used to. Someone one time told me that the only reason they never respond to an invitation is because I don't do a song before the invitation. <laughs> kind of silly. When I was a young kid, I was in church, and I went to the front. I hadn't paid attention to a single thing the pastor said, but I knew that he sounded discouraged, and I thought, man, if I go to the front, uh, he'll see me go to the front, and he'll be happy with me. So I went to the front. And what became what was supposed to be a sacred place became a chance for me to refine my reputation with the pastor. And so when we started the church, with that in my mind, I thought, you know, sometimes it's just good to sit out. Sometimes it's the most humble thing you can do is just sit down where you are where no one else notices. You don't have to go to the front to get a bunch of attention. But can I say this? One of the things I've learned, sometimes the front is the only place you can go. It's the only place you should go. And so for you, if joy has been taken from you, from a parasite, maybe the front is the right place for you. If you can't come to the front of pride, then don't come to the front. But if you're not coming to the front out of fear, then you're raw. Bow the knee to the king and give him what he deserves. He wants to restore joy in you. He did a lot to try and guarantee that you'd be happy. 
And so maybe you've identified some ways that you've tried to bring happiness into your life and you want to give those to Jesus. I want to give you a chance to do that today. By the way, you can stand where you are and pray just because you didn't sit down doesn't mean you didn't respond. We don't keep score and I don't pay attention. But today during the invitation, if you'd like to talk to Jesus, you are welcome to use the front. It's open for you. If the best thing for you to do is sit down and do that as well. Just give Jesus what he deserves. And then finally, if you're here and you have never asked Jesus, please save me. When have you repented? I was seven years old when I did. If you're not sure and you can't identify, are you sure you're God's child? If you don't know for sure, then would you today put all your confidence in the death and resurrection of Jesus, turn away from your sin, repent, ask him to save you. And today can be one of the most important days of your life. You can do that right now. In fact, if you want help, Pastor Matt is going to be right here toward the front. If you come to the front and look at me like, hey, I need help. I want to ask Jesus into my heart. I'm just a little afraid. You don't need to be afraid. Salvation has come to you today. And we'll make sure that Pastor Matt has somebody. Uh, Ladies, if you come, we'll get a lady to sit down with you. Someone that has asked Jesus into their heart already that can help you with that. Otherwise, come to the front and do it on your own. Father, as we go into invitation, may you be glorified by heartfelt responses that have all of the intention of follow through living differently. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. As the piano begins to play, we'll give you a chance to talk to the Lord if you need to. If you've got parasites in your life stealing your joy, identify them and get rid of them right now. Talk to the Lord. Father, as we prepare to close the service today, we want to thank you for setting so many free and allowing us to experience the joy that you brought into our lives when we first asked you to save us. Father, there is no way for me to measure how many people or who exactly is going to see this message, and so we trust that your Holy Spirit is going to connect some dots for some folks. I rejoice at the thought that someone might come to know you as Savior because of your word today. May we always be confident that you're working, never discouraged, for you have brought us to do a good work and we cannot come down. Help us to love you more. Thank you for all the good things you've brought to our life that we don't deserve. And above all, thank you for setting us free and giving us a new name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you would mind, just grab a seat real quick. Going to close the service a little bit differently. It's November 14th. Do you know what that means? Yes, sir. So I just wanted to pray over the guys that are headed out for not only a successful hunt for their deer season, but also that God would keep you safe. Bullets will be flying, men will be ducking, deer will be dying. And so we hope that you fill your freezer with God's plenty. If that's what your desire is to do, but we want to keep you safe. I'm not going to embarrass you by making you stand up. But if there is any chance that you might go out during deer season, I want to pray for God's blessing on your life. Would you raise your hand? I got folks online right now that are going to be headed out that are watching this service. I want to make sure we pray for them. A few of you guys. All right. The rest of you that aren't going, come and talk to me. We'll talk about why you're not. We'll get your heart right with the Lord. Get a gun in your hands and put you in the woods so no cars hit any deer next year. All right, we're so glad for you guys that get to go out. Man, enjoy God's creation. Get alone with him, and don't forget to talk to him while you're out there. 
I don't have a problem with begging God for a deer. I've done it before, and I'll probably do it again. It's a good time to get to talk to Jesus. I just want to pray and ask for God's safety and blessing on your hunt this year. Father, as we close this service, getting ready for November 15th, we find ourselves in this peculiar place where, Lord, we're, we're allowed to hunt the, cre uh, the creation that you've created for a season. What a wonderful combination of both your authority and the authority that you have placed over us. Lord, the king's heart is in your hands. And so we get to go hunting tomorrow. And Lord, first of all, we pray that you keep everyone safe. Some guys may be doing quite a bit of driving. So we pray that you keep them safe. Father, great fellowship opportunity. Maybe some guys are going to be hunting with people that don't know Jesus. Pray for a chance to share the gospel. Lord, we ask that you would bless each hunter with your presence, most of all, but also with a chance to, to maybe harvest a deer. No matter what happens, Father, we trust you, and we do all things carefully. We do all things with your blessing. And so we look forward to a wonderful deer season and great stories being told afterward. Dismiss us with your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you. You are dismissed.